the unusual part about this family was that they uh, all of the kids refused to buy soap. Um, they ran out of liquid body wash uh, and they waited for their mum to go and buy it for them. Uh, they were all on the internet complaining about having to use bar soap instead of liquid body wash. Um, that was a bit, I thought, maybe perhaps a little bit unusual, uh, uh, that, that family. That, but I mean, maybe that's just a quirk of their family. Um, every family has its quirks. It's a little bit unusual. We've all had different experiences of family too, haven't we? Some of us have had uh, a really good experience of family. Some of us have had great families. And some of us probably have a bit of baggage with the idea of family. Uh, that makes it complex, I think, when we realise that a, a core part, an important part of being a follower of Jesus is realising that we join a family, that we become part of God's family, and that we get countless brothers and sisters in Christ. But that's the image that God used to to help us to understand. He invites us into his family and he uses this to help us understand our relationship with him and our relationship with one another. I, I wonder if that's because we, we all know what family is supposed to be like. Even if we haven't had a great experience, we can usually imagine what a good experience, what family should be like. When we become part of God's family, uh, unfortunately, we realise that our church family isn't necessarily perfect though either. It can have its problems. We've got our own idiosyncrasies and and little strange things that we all like. And we've all got our own problems. Each church has its problems. Our church family has its problems. But what we do have is a perfect father, and we know that we will have a perfect family. One day, this family will be exactly what it's supposed to be. So we're going to think a little bit about uh, being part of God's family this morning. Uh, And we're going to begin uh, in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to spend all of our time in Ephesians and and look at the way that Ephesians picks up this idea of being part of God's family. Picks up a few times throughout the book. Uh, And uh, the first thing we're going to see this morning from Ephesians chapter 1 is that being part of God's family means peace. Peace with God and peace with one another. Read from Ephesians 1 with me. Verse 3, be blessed, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. The idea of being part of God's family has a vertical aspect to it and a horizontal aspect. Here, we're seeing the vertical aspect, the relationship between us and God. In the Bible, God invites those who trust in Jesus to call him their father. And he does that based on what's happening in this passage. Here we see that God chose his people to be adopted to himself. Adopted. There's two things to note about adoption, our adoption by God. First, adoption means a future. God took us, he picked us up off the streets, we were hopeless, we had no hope. In Ephesians 2, we see that we were dead, and he brings us into his family. He brings us to life, he gives us hope, and he gives us a future and an inheritance. An inheritance of eternal life and abundant blessing forever with God in the new heavens and the new earth. The second thing to note is that God adopted us through Jesus Christ. That's what it says there in verse 5. Adopted through Jesus Christ. The very next verse, uh, verses, verse 7, spells out how we were adopted through Christ. In him, that's Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. We were adopted because Jesus' death dealt with the chasm that was between us and God. And that was sin. Sin was what was separating us from God And that sin, our sin, was put upon Jesus at his death. He took the penalty for us. And so now we have redemption through his blood. Forgiveness of our trespasses. Jesus took our place, closed the chasm, brought us near to God so that he would adopt us if we have faith in him. That's pretty incredible. We're adopted. It's incredible. We're adopted by God through the sacrifice of his son. He gave up his sons that we might be his children. Jesus died for us because God loved us so much that he wanted to adopt us into his family. God went to pretty extreme lengths to adopt us because of his love for us. So now we have peace with God 
as his adopted children. That's the vertical aspect uh, of being part of the family of God. There's also a horizontal aspect. We'll, we'll look at chapter 2 for that. Chapter 2, verses 13 to 19. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And it might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to those who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now there's, there's a lot going on in this passage. Uh, but here Paul's talking about how the Gentiles were far off from God. And there was distinctions and there was conflict between the Gentiles and the Jews. And just like God, uh, Jesus closed the chasm, chasm <laughs> between God and humanity, he also closed the chasm between human and human. And he did it again through his death on the cross. As Jesus died on the cross, he made a way that all people come to God through faith. All people come to him in the same way. It's not law for some and grace for others. Jesus tore down the dividing wall of hostility. And the results of this is that we're all fellow citizens, saints, or members of the household of God, part of God's family. Being part of God's family means peace with God, and it means peace and unity with one another. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the uh, idea of a found family. I learned about the concept fairly recently. Um, I heard about it when someone online, they were talking about their favourite novel tropes and they love found fam family tropes. Um, it's it's kind of like, so someone's had a hard time with their family or perhaps they, um, they're an orphan and the story as the story goes on, they find a group of people that are sort of all band together and they get closer and closer over time and by the end of the story, they realise that they have a new family, a found family. Uh, or perhaps a family that they've chosen to be their family over their other family. Do you realise, brothers and sisters, that we are family? The person sitting next to you is a brother or sister in Christ. Uh, these are the people that we will spend eternity with. Not just the next 20 years, but the next 20,000 years. God has brought us into his family. Jesus died to bring us into his family. God's chosen all of us who trust in Christ to be part of his family forever. So I want to point out uh, two things that I think flow out of this idea of being part of God's family this morning. And the first is that church is about the people, not the place. Now, the building is a building, but the people are the church. We are the church. The people are God's family. Jesus died so that God might adopt people. Jesus died to bring peace between people. He didn't die for this building. He didn't die for a ministry model. He didn't die for Sunday services. He died for people. And so ultimately, that's what we're here for and that's what we need to care about. God's family, our brothers and sisters in Christ. All of the building and the money and the services and the ministries that we have are here to serve God and to serve his family. Second thing, it's just an encouragement to keep working and keep going at being family here at church. Uh, we're not just a special interest group. We are family. We're brothers and sisters. How might seeing your church family as family change the way you interact with people this year? There are lots of things you can talk about here, but I just want to suggest one thing, one way that you might want to put into practice or, or implement this year. One suggestion that might be helpful, that's making the most of the in-between times. Make the most of before an event or after uh, an event. Come to church early and leave late. Uh, don't treat Sundays like a service that you come to, but maybe like a family gathering where you come to spend time with your family. Make the most of morning tea. That's a time that we've specifically set aside so that we can spend it together. Uh, what I mean is this. I went to a birthday party uh, yesterday, actually, for my uh, brother. 
Uh, but when we first arrived, we were the first ones there and there was a bit of waiting before the rest of the family arrived. And so we chatted. I talked about, we talked about how my brother was going, what he was up to, uh, how his new job was going. That's what we do with family, isn't it? So let's do that with each other. I want to encourage you to make the most of... Uh, I want to encourage you this morning to make the most of morning tea, but not just morning tea, of all of the in-between times. Share our lives with one another. The times between Sundays. Live our lives together. We invite each other to the things you're doing. We talked about hospitality a few weeks ago. Let's do that. Being family will mean being with one another. It will mean getting to know one another. And it will mean loving one another. And that's because God has loved us. As God's children, we're meant to reflect the love that God has with us to one another in the world around us. That's our second point this morning. God's family reflects God's love. Ephesians picks up this family image again in chapter 5. Uh, read for chapter 5 verses 1 to 2 with me. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Here Paul says that because we are God's children, we should imitate him. And then he spells that out for us to make it really clear. He says that we should walk in love like Christ loved us. And then he spells that out to make it really clear for us that Christ loved us by dying for us. See, God's love isn't this sort of amorphous, vibey, empty kind of just feeling of love. It's got context and it's got content. The context is what we've seen throughout Ephesians today and all the rest of Ephesians, but we've seen some of it today. And it's this radical self-sacrificial love where the God of the universe becomes a man and dies for his enemies that they might know him. And we're to love each other, that we, that, they might be, that we might be adopted by him. And we're to love one another the way Jesus loved us. Jesus died for us no matter how sinful we are, no matter how offensive our sin was to God, despite the fact that we're God's enemies. We're to love each other like Jesus who died to break down the dividing wall of hostility. Jesus' love is a radical, unthinkable kind of love. It's not easy, but it's the kind of love we're called to. Now, this, uh, this radical, unthinkable kind of love is the kind of love that lets people who are really struggling continue to look out for others and care for them. This radical, unthinkable kind of love is the kind of love that allows people to forgive those who've hurt them, even when they've hurt them really badly. This radical, unthinkable kind of love is the kind of love that allowed Elizabeth Elliot to share the gospel with the people that had killed her husband. Uh, many of you will, have know, will know of Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. They were missionaries to Ecuador. And while they were there, and uh, a few other missionaries were there with them, they were working this sort of long process of making contact with the people they were trying to reach. But while they were doing that, uh, the tribe they were seeking to contact killed Jim and a few of the other missionaries that were with them. And yet Elizabeth still sought to share the gospel with them. She ended up working with the tribe for two years. Apparently she had a radio show and each week she would begin with the phrase, you are loved with an everlasting love. Elizabeth Elliot loved these strangers enough to share the gospel with them despite what they'd done. Jesus loved his enemies so much that he died for us, taking God's wrath upon himself. Do we love our brothers and sisters like that? That's radical, isn't it? That's unthinkable. Is this the way that we love one another? Brothers and sisters, we are God's family and God's children are meant to reflect God's love. We're meant to reflect it to each other and to the world around us. That's a challenge. It's easy to say, but actually doing it is another thing. Let me encourage you this year, not just to say that you love the people around you, but to die for them. I don't know what that will look like. Uh, there's lots of different things. Perhaps it will look like giving up on your pride and apologising to someone. Perhaps it will look like forgiving someone. Perhaps it might mean sticking around when someone offends you. Perhaps it will look like spending your hard-earned cash for the sake of someone else. There, there are a million ways that this could pan out. But let's seek to love one another like this because God loved us through Jesus' death on the cross for us. 
Now, one of the reasons it's so hard to love the people around us like Jesus did is because they're not perfect. Uh, sometimes they aren't even all that great at all. You see, you see, this actually isn't our found family per se, because really we didn't choose the people around us. God chose us and stuck us all together. And now we're meant to learn to love one another. That means we're not perfect. It means we have our problems. The reality is we're all sinners. But God loved us and died for us despite our sinfulness. He's not asking us to do anything he hasn't already done. In fact, he's specifically asking us to imitate him. We're not perfect and our church family isn't perfect. Just like real family, it can be quite hard. But one thing we all have is a perfect father. And one perfect brother, the Lord Jesus. We have a perfect loving God who's actually working within each of us by his spirit to make this a possibility. In fact, he's working to make this a reality because that's where our church family is headed. One day, God's family will be the perfect family. The family that perfectly reflects God's love to one another and to the world around us. But that won't be till Christ comes back. We don't know when that will be. And so in the meantime, let's delight in being part of God's family. Let's delight in knowing that we have peace with God, that we have unity and peace with one another. And let's seek to love one another as Jesus loved us. And we're going to need God's help to do that. So I'm going to pray and ask that God might help us to do that. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for adopting us into your family. Thank you for bringing peace and unity and saving us all through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. Lord, please help us to love one another with the love that Jesus showed, that radical, unthinkable love. Lord, make that a reality in our lives. Father, this will be really hard, so please give us strength and please keep our eyes fixed on eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, respond now by singing our final song, Speak, O Lord. So please stand together and let's sing.
Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, please hang around for some morning tea. A great chance to chat uh, and see how we're going. Um, don't forget to sign up for the Digging Deeper Conference. Grab your uh, yearly planner or sign up for a Bible study uh, over on the table over there. Um, I'm going to finish by just reading this benediction from Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Have a good week.